you will. I will anyway. How's everyone this morning? That was kind of like a delayed response. My name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at The Way. It is my privilege and honor to be here with you all this morning. There's no place I would rather be. I promise you that, and I hope that you feel the same way. And what a privilege it is to come together with you all uh, before the Lord this morning. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. As we take a break from the book of Genesis, we've been in Genesis for about, uh, well, since the first of the year. Uh, and we're going to be in Genesis for a little while longer. Uh, but we're going to take a break from the books of Genesis. And this started, we're going to do a, a mini-series uh, about making disciples. November will be a missions month for us as we talk about the practical application of our church making disciples. And this actually started two weeks ago uh, out at the creek when we baptized Josh and Josiah. And we talked about our commission. We talked about our mission to be disciples and to make disciples. That from Matthew 28, 19, we see the commission given to us where Jesus says to us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them all that I have commanded you. This is our mission. This is our co-mission. But what will this look like? How does this look in the context of the church? It ought to be the church that comes alongside you. It ought to be in the context of the church that we fulfill the Great Commission, our mission. So how do we do this? I want to talk to you today about a matter of life and death. You know, sometimes we come to church and we come before the Lord flippantly. And we, and we, take, uh, we take for granted the fact that we can come together as a body and hear a word from the Lord. But today I am praying that we will come before the Lord seriously because I'm talking about a matter of life and death today, utmost urgency today. We're going to talk about parenting today, and we're going to talk about adoption today. I resisted the urge to declare today Adoption Sunday. Instead, we're going to declare it just the Lord's Sunday. Uh, but I resisted the urge to declare this Adoption Sunday. However, we're going to talk about adoption, some the physical act of adoption. Let's get into the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus says to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, it's tempting to want to let the passions of man govern what we do. It's tempting to, to take scripture as a preacher, as a pastor, to take scripture and say, well, I have something I want to say. You know, I have a point that I would like to make and to use scripture to make the point that I want to make. But it is not my words that convict anybody. It's not my words that move anybody to act. It is the word of God that does this. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, tells us that the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword. And it penetrates to the division of soul and spirit and bone and marrow. It is the word of God that moves in the hearts of men to call us to obedience, not by words. I love the words of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 55. He says, so shall the words that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. The word of God never returns to him empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The word of God is deliberately spoken with, an, with a purpose, with an intention, and it always accomplishes its purpose. The word of God never returns to the Lord void or empty. It always accomplishes that for which he sent it out. And that tells us that the Lord sends out his word intentionally. Let's get back to the text here. So Jesus has appeared to them. He's been resurrected. He spends 40 days with them speaking about the kingdom of God. We read in verse 3, after he presents himself alive to them, his suffering by many proofs. In verse 4, while he's staying with them, he tells them, do not leave Jerusalem. They're all assembled together in Jerusalem, trying to digest what has just happened, what has just occurred. They've seen their Lord and Savior crucified, dead, and buried. They had lost hope. But then all of a sudden, there he is, and he spends 40 days with them. 
And he commands them to remain in Jerusalem for a period of time for the promise of the Father. And he gives them the promise in verse 5. He says, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, they come together and they ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom in Israel? They still did not understand the promise of God. And you say, how could they spend 40 days with the resurrected Christ and still not understand what was going on? But that's understandable because they had not yet received the Holy Spirit as he tells them. Verse 7, he says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Listen, there are no imperatives in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Our command comes from the Great Commission to make disciples. And this singular command to make disciples ought to undergird every single thing that we do. Every single thing that we say, that we think, every acti activity we participate in, particularly as a collective church body, ought to contribute to the making of disciples. This is not here in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. This is prophetic. Jesus is merely stating a fact. He says, this is what's going to happen. He says, you will receive power. It's going to happen. When? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. Right where you're at. And in Judea. The area around Jerusalem. And in Samaria. Those people that you really don't care for. And even to the ends of the earth. This is prophetic of Jesus. Again, our command, our commission comes to us from the Great Commission. And we see this prophecy, these prophetic words from Jesus begin to come true in the very next chapter of Acts chapter 2 when it talks about the day of Pentecost. And we see that the Holy Spirit descends upon them as they're gathered together. And there come from heaven a sound like a rushing wind. It fills the entire house where they are. And divided tongues as a fire appear to them and rest on them. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances. But then Peter stands up. And Peter preaches the first Christian sermon ever preached. He quotes largely from the book of Joel. And then after he preaches the sermon, it says the people are pierced to the heart. They hear the word of God and it pierces them to the heart. And they say to Peter, what then must we do? What should we do because of this great word? And he says to repent and be baptized. Repent, be saved, and be baptized. And that's exactly what happens is they baptize 3,000 people that day. This is the birth of the church. Isn't it interesting that the birth of the church is shepherded in by the preaching of the word of God? Isn't that an interesting thing to notice? And from that day forward, exactly as Jesus said it would happen, Happens every single time a person comes to faith in Christ and becomes a member of the church universal. They are simultaneously baptized in the Holy Spirit. They are sealed with the Holy Spirit. They are filled with the Holy Spirit and they are continually filled with the Holy Spirit. The language there indicates an ongoing action and they are also empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will give us power. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that power. Listen, that tells us that the task to which he had called us requires power. That the task to which he has given us is a supernatural act. Listen, you cannot make disciples apart from the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And that's part of the issues with the church today. That's part of the issues with the Western church is we have legions of non-disciples attempting to make disciples sort of in their own power. But it is a supernatural activity, the making of disciples. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 tells us, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And what is this power that he gives us? We see this power listed throughout the New Testament. We talk about the empowering gifts 
of the Holy Spirit. And I'm talking about gifts of helping and wisdom and knowledge and faith and healing and prophecy and discernment and tongues, interpretation. Administration is a gift. Service, teaching, exhortation, generosity, leadership, mercy. Listen, if you are a follower in the Lord of the Lord Jesus, if you are a born-again believer, you have been given at least one, likely more than one, of these gifts for the making of disciples, for the building up of the church. These gifts don't exist to glorify themselves. They exist for the making of disciples and the edification of the church. And that is a supernatural act requiring the power of the Holy Spirit. It's power with a purpose. He says you're going to witness you're going to evangelize. Again, another issue at the Western church is we seek to separate evangelism and making disciples. We say, now I'm going to make disciples now. And now I'm going to evangelize. They're all part of the same thing. Evangelism, being a witness, is all part of making disciples. And if you return to the Great Commission, what you will see is that the Great Commission is bracketed by the power of Jesus in the presence of Jesus. How does he open the Great Commission? He says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and upon earth. Jesus is the possessor of all authority. There's not a molecule that moves in the cosmos apart from the authority of Jesus. And so when you move in his authority in the making of disciples, you're not moving in your own authority. You are expressing the authority of he to whom all authority has been given. And so when we are making disciples, we are being the agents of the authority of Jesus. And then he brackets the Great Commission with the presence of Jesus. He says, and I will be with you until the end of the ages. Listen, making disciples is hard. Your average Christian, you ask them, it's like, how do I make disciples? We don't even know. It's only been in the last couple of years that I've really, I think, figured out what it means to make a disciple. But Jesus says, look, I'm with you. Always. To the end of the ages. You're not all by yourself. You're not all alone trying to do this. He is with you. We have the power of Jesus and the presence of Jesus and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And he tells us how we do this. Going as you go. As you go. Baptizing, teaching. We're going to talk for the next couple of weeks about going. What does it mean as you go as we make disciples? Listen, I'd like to make a statement right up front about the making of disciples. As followers of Jesus, I really don't care if you ever go on another short-term mission trip. I really don't care how many church programs you participate in. I really don't care how deeply you plug in. I do care. But listen, make disciples of your children. There would be a global revolution in the name of Christ if the followers of Jesus would commit to that singular task of making disciples of their children. There would be a global revival if that were to happen. I love the words of Jesus in John 14, 12. Jesus says to the disciples in John 14, 12, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. What is Jesus talking about? What are these greater works? You say, well, I'm going to do some kind of miracle. Jesus did miracles. Those aren't greater than him. You say, well, I'm going to heal somebody from a disease. Well, Jesus healed people. That's not greater than him. You say, well, I'm going to even raise somebody from the dead. There's people who claim to be able to raise people from the dead. Well, Jesus did that. That's not greater than Jesus. What are these greater works? Than Jesus. Who could possibly do a greater work than Jesus? Listen, consider the ministry of Jesus. The more truth that Jesus taught, the more people abandoned him. They left him. They heard hard truths from him in John chapter 6, and they left him. And he ended up dying alone on the cross as every single one of his followers abandoned him. What are the greater works? Back to Acts chapter 1. Jesus tells us, he gives us prophetic empowerment. He says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then there's a prophetic enactment. Exactly this happens. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's right where you're at. In Judea, the area around Jerusalem, Samaria, the people that you hate, and even to 
the ends of the earth. This happens. In the book of Acts is the record of this happening. In many ways, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is the thesis statement for the book of Acts. Consider that in less than a generation, 15 to 17 years, a church, a flourishing church, existed in the city of Rome. This is the very seat of persecution within 15 to 17 years. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 in 55 to 57 AD, 20 some years after the death of Christ, he says to the Romans, he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. The Roman church was renowned after 20 some years after the death of Christ. The Roman church was so well known that their faith was proclaimed in all the nations. 49 AD, the Emperor Claudius issued an edict expelling all Jews from the city of Rome. Remember, they couldn't tell Jews from Christians. And why did he do that? Because of the teachings of a man called Crestus. That's from the Roman historian Suetonius. 15 to 17 years after the death of Christ, there's a flourishing church in Rome, so much so that the emperor believes he needs to expel all Jews from the city of Rome. But how did that church get there? There's no record of any apostle ever going to Rome. There's no record of Peter or Paul or anybody else ever planting a church in Rome. How on earth did it get there? Listen, the great error of the Western church is we ask for service with no sacrifice. In many ways, I seek to ask that which is least from you. I seek to afford you all. The church seeks to afford its people the illusion of service without actually asking you to sacrifice. Because if I ask too much of you, you may just get up and go somewhere else and take your tithe check with you. How on earth did the church make its way to Rome in 15 to 17 years? I'll tell you exactly how that happened. Legions of ordinary Christians, as if there were such a thing, legions of ordinary Christians committed to make disciples of all the nations, starting right at home with their children. We read in Acts chapter 2 of Pentecost, there are believers or devout Jews from around the kingdom at, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost including people from Rome. There are people from Rome at Pentecost. And they hear the preaching of the word of God. And the word of God penetrates to their hearts and they fall to their knees in salvation and they are saved. And then they do exactly what Jesus said they would do. They make disciples of the nations starting right where they were in Jerusalem, right where they were at I love the imagery in Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah talks about the kingdom of God like a tent. It's like a tent. And why do we need a tent? We need a tent for shelter, for safety. Why do we need that? Because there's a storm coming. The wrath of God abides upon the children of wrath. There's a storm coming. And so we have this tent. And and, and the tent is the family. And my intention in the family as the father is is to bring the members of my family and get them up underneath of the tent of a gospel family so that they might find shelter from the wrath to come. Listen, this is the mandate given to the followers of Christ. Genesis chapter 1 is where we see the mandate first given. Genesis chapter 1, 28, God says to the couple, he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. God is commanding the man to know the woman in the strictest biblical sense of the word and to bring his children up in the way of the Lord. Now listen, the fall, the fall did not negate that requirement. If, it, if anything, the fall made that the requirement that much more desperate, that much more urgent. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the great Shema, this great monolithic statement of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And it doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, you shall teach these words to your children diligently. We got to teach these words to our children diligently. 
Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, he says, Bring up a child in the way of the Lord, and when he is older, he will not depart from it. Now, we know this is a general principle. This is not a 100% guarantee. There are children brought up in the way of the Lord who do reject the way of God, who do reject that way. But in general, we know this to be true. Bring up a child in the way of the Lord, and when he's older, he will not depart from it. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, we've been studying Ephesians in our home group. And the first three chapters tell us great truths about God, and the last three chapters tell us how to act because of these great truths. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 tells us, Fathers, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but what? Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Listen, we've got to change our mindset. We've got to change our view on how we see our mission, on how we see our children. Think about how people see their children, particularly in our context today. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is Psalm 127. The psalmist says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb of a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Listen, this is a matter of life and death. The heart of a child is fertile for the gospel. But as the child grows older, scripture tells us, his heart progressively gets harder and harder. It is a fact that if a child grows up and leaves the home without becoming a follower of Christ, that there is statistically speaking a good chance that that child will one day perish in his sins as an adult. Now there are adult converts, I'm an adult convert, so there are exceptions to that rule. But it is a fact that children largely inherit the faith of their parents. It is a fact that parents largely inherit the faith of their fathers. Their fathers. So I'm going to cite a study, 2000 Swiss study. If you would like the link, hit me up. It's on JSTORS. If you have an account, I read it. This study was very profound, but it teaches, reaffirms biblical truth and the facts that we know it. If both parents are of the faith, there's a very good chance that the child will one day be of the faith. If the father is not of the faith and the mother is, there's a very minimal chance that that child will become of the faith. Even less than if both parents are not of the faith. Even more interesting, if the father is faithful and the mother is not, there's an even greater chance the child will be of the faith than if both parents are faithful. Children inherit the faith of their parents, but really it's the father's. Can you imagine the evangelistic explosion if the men of this nation, the men of the church, would commit to making disciples of their children? We would literally turn this nation upside down and inside out. Get back to the text of Acts chapter 1. What confronted the church after the day of Pentecost? What confronted the church but a dark and broken and pagan world that was completely hostile to anything of the gospel. This is what confronted them. But nevertheless, Jesus says exactly what will happen. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right where you're at. You don't have to go halfway around the world to hand out water bottles to a bunch of strangers that you'll never see again. Who has the Lord placed underneath your purview, in your home even? And again, I know not everybody's married. I know not everybody has children. But the fact is, most of us will be. Most of us will, at some point in time, Jerusalem. And for most of us, Jerusalem is our children. It's a matter of life and death. Truly a matter of life and death. Which begs an obvious question. What about those who have no father? It is a fact that the most effective evangelist of anyone is a loving and engaged father. What of those who have no father? 
I'd like to talk to you today about our dark and pagan world that confronts us. The mission is the same for us, the Great Commission. The model given us by Jesus, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, that model stands valid today for us. We are confronted by an equally dark and pagan world hostile to the gospel. Adoption is a social issue. Each year, 25,000 foster kids turn 18 and graduate the foster system. Now, most of these kids have the opportunity. They can stay in the foster system until they're 21, uh, but most of them choose not to. By this time, they're tired of uh, social workers and uh, you know, meetings and things of that nature. So most of them exit the system, 25,000 to 30,000 each year across our nation. 20% of them are instantly homeless. 20%. Less than 3% of them will ever go to college and get a degree. Less than 3% of them. Within four years, over half of them will be unemployed. 60% of the boys will be convicted of a crime at some point in time. 7 in 10 of the girls will be pregnant out of wedlock. Half of them will become addicted to some form of substance. 25% of them have PTSD. And perhaps most damning, one third of them, 33, 33% or roughly 10,000 of them, have been waiting for three years or more in the foster system for somebody to come along and adopt them. These are the facts. This is the dark pagan world that confronts us today. I'd like to just give you a few more facts. And again, my intent today is to give you the word of God with some facts of reality. In 1973, the average size of the American home was 1,600 square feet. Today, it's 2,400 square feet. Almost double in size. In 1973, the average family was three persons, the average household in America. Today, the average household is less than two and a half people. We live in the wealthiest nation in the history of this planet. And what has happened is our homes have become more and more palatial as our family sizes have shrunk. The living space per person has more than doubled in our nation. These are just some facts I wanted to give you. Let me give you some facts about Tennessee. There are 8,000 foster children presently in Tennessee. There are only 4,000 foster homes. The opioid epidemic has ravaged the state of Tennessee. Believe it or not, we are the second worst when it comes to rates of addiction of opioids in the nation. And there are presently 864 foster kids whose parental rights have been terminated. They have no parents officially. Not even 1,864 in our state. If they are over the age of eight, there's only a 20% chance that they will ever be adopted. Nobody wants to adopt teenagers. Meaning that for 80% of them, they will spend 10 more years in the foster system before they are emancipated from the foster system to a life of affliction. 864 children available time now. There are 3,309 Southern Baptist churches in the state of Tennessee. There are 700 churches, Southern Baptist only, in the city of Nashville alone. There are almost 50 Southern Baptist churches in this city of Clarksville. That's just Southern Baptist, not counting all of our brothers and sisters in Christ in these other denominations. If the church wanted to, if but a fraction of the people of the church would raise their hands and say, here am I, send me, we would eliminate the issue of children without homes instantly, without even trying hard. If just a few percentage of professing believers, adoption is a tremendous social issue. But that's not the worst. Here's the real issue. And I learned this years ago. Adoption is a gospel issue. 
It is a great gospel issue. Because the issue is, is that most of these children have not been reared in a loving home. In the context of the gospel. And every year they're graduating and leaving the home. And they don't have the one person, the people, who are the most effective evangelists. They don't know Christ. Who's going to tell them? This is a matter of life and death. It truly is. Let's see, get to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When the church is moving in the authority of Jesus and in the power of Jesus and in the presence of Jesus with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If you'll notice, there's no mention of this. And why is that? Because it's assumed. It's assumed that the church could no more turn a blind eye to those who are languishing in affliction. There's no DCS. There's no government program. There's no social workers. All that there was was the church. And in many ways, these 864 children with terminated rights, this is an indictment on the church. I pray that that would weigh heavy upon our hearts this morning. Listen, we've got to change the way that we think about this. Here's the deal. As followers of Christ, we don't adopt because we're some sort of rescuers. Like we're superheroes sent to rescue somebody. We adopt because we have been rescued. It's like forgiveness. I don't forgive somebody else to do them a favor. I forgive others because I think of the, the vast forgiveness that Christ has levied upon me. Despite my wickedness, despite my sins, he forgives me. And because of that, I pour out forgiveness on others. And it's the exact same way with adoption. I don't adopt because I want to rescue somebody. I adopt because I have been rescued. There is very few institutions that display the heart of Christ, the character of God, more than physical adoption. Physical adoption is a physical representation of a spiritual reality. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have at once you have bowed your head and repented of your sin and said, Lord, I am a sinner. Save me. And he's done that. And at the moment of salvation, there's a couple of, of things that happen at the moment of salvation. You're justified. You're declared innocent of all sins, past, present, and future. You're simultaneously begin the process of sanctification. Where for the rest of my life, I will be conformed into the image of Christ. And so I'm glorified in death and will be with him. And at the same time, you are adopted as a child of God. If you've been saved, you're a son of God. You're a daughter of the king. And so physical adoption is a physical representation of a spiritual reality. We see an adoption, the union of the physical and the spiritual. Listen, Jesus worked in the physical and the spiritual all the time. He fed people. He healed them of their diseases, but he also forgave them of their sins and called them to repentance. Listen, the heart of Christ, you can't study Jesus. You can't study the Lord without seeing his heart for the downtrodden, his heart for the afflicted, his heart for the least of these. I love the words of David in Psalm 27. David in Psalm 27 says this. He says, my father and my mother have forsaken me. My father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me in. My father and my mother have forsaken me. Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6, describing God. He is the father of the fatherless. He's a protector of widows. Is God in his holy habitation. I love the commands given us by Isaiah in chapter 1, verse 17. He says, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. And what is justice to the fatherless? You hear a lot of talk about justice in our nation today. But what is justice for the fatherless? But a father who would love him and bring him up in the way of the Lord. Even in the New Testament, we get to the book of James, chapter 1, verse 27. James tells us 
that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. James says, this is religion. Let me boil it down for you. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Listen, we're saved by faith alone through grace alone. But our faith ought to have wheels. It ought to have legs. If there's no physical manifestation of our faith, then do we really have faith? James tells us no. That you have a dead faith, which is really no faith at all. And he says, this is real faith. Caring for orphans and widows in their distress. Why orphans and widows? Well, again, in James's day, orphans and widows were two of the most helpless classes of people in society. A woman, anyway, in those days was in many ways a second-class citizen. And a widow was really at the mercy of a cruel world. But today we see that it's not the same. Our culture is different. You know, women have rights and, 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 and protections under the law. And there's all sorts of things. And a widow today, yeah, it's very sad. It's, it's heartbreaking to think of being a widow. But they are not the oppressed citizens that they were in the day of James. But in many ways, orphans today are afflicted even more than they were in the days of James. This is a matter of life and death, church. Life and death. Perhaps the words of Jesus speak to us the most in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus is talking about judgment. And he says on that day, there's going to be two groups of people. There's going to be the sheep and the goats. You can't ride the fence with Jesus. You're either one or the other with respect to Jesus. And how does he recognize them? Well, he says to the sheep, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And they're going to say, Lord, when did we see you and do all these things? And he says, when you did this to the least of these, you did it to me. And then he's going to say to those on his left, the goats, depart from me into the eternal fire. I was hungry. You gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You didn't welcome me. I was naked. You didn't clothe me. I was sick in prison and you didn't visit me. And the people will say, Lord, when did we see you like this? And he says, when you neglected the least of these, it's as if you neglected me. Listen, our works do not earn us any merit with the Lord when it comes to salvation. But in salvation, we find that works naturally flow out of that. And those works ought to look like caring for the least of these. And is there more least of these than a young man or a young woman without a father? Is there anybody more afflicted in our reality today than them? I don't know. Listen, it's hard. I understand that. I mean, you can't introduce a child to your home without it turning your world upside down. And I'm watching that happen now with my daughter and her husband have their first child. And I'm watching the reality of their existence just completely change forever. It will never be the same. Amen. And certainly you could not introduce a child from another family without it being difficult, without it changing your life forever. Amen. What if it would have changed somebody else's life forever? A lot of people are scared. They look at these children and see brokenness. And I will admit that there is brokenness there like you would never believe. And maybe you don't understand. Maybe you know. Maybe you have experience. Maybe you were once one of these kids. The two primary reasons that a kid might come into the system are neglect. And abuse. Neglect and abuse. Having been betrayed by the people that they were supposed to be able to, that were supposed to love them the most. Betrayed by them. And they come into the system. Brokenness. But shouldn't these be the ones that we go to the most? Lavish love upon them, if only to tell them it's not your fault. And I'll love you anymore. Shouldn't those be the ones we go to the most? 
like arrows in the hands of a warrior or children of one's youth. There's broken arrows littering this battlefield right now. Would you pick up an arrow off the ground and bind it up? Launch it into the battle. Back to Isaiah chapter 54, the tent analogy. Isaiah tells us to stretch out your tent. Everybody's got a tent, the tent of your gospel family. Would you stretch that tent out a little bit farther? Would you lengthen your ropes a little bit? Would you drive the stakes in just a little bit tighter, a little bit harder, so you can pull another underneath the shelter of your tent in a gospel family? This is a gospel issue. It's a supernatural act. Listen, if anybody knows me, you know that this is supernatural because I never even wanted to be a father. I, I, I joke all the time that I don't even really like kids. <laughs> I used to envision myself being, my brother had kids, my little <coughs> brother, and I envisioned myself being like, you know, rich Uncle Brad, single Brad, and I was coming to town and just do whatever. And of course, I chose high paying occupations, army and ministry. But let me tell you what, I would not trade my sons for the world. I can't imagine my life without my sons. God knew what he was doing when he put that upon my heart. Knew what he was doing when he did that. Let me give you just a few more facts in closing. Proverbs chapter 24, very convicting verse. You faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. This is, we're surrounded every day by people being taken away to death, stumbling to the slaughter. Listen to this. If you say, Behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? We know. We know that this is a social issue, but even more, we know that this is a gospel issue. Right here in Montgomery County, there are kids available right now that need a home. It is a fact that the Word of God does not return void. We started preaching about this a number of years ago, and since that time, from our tiny little fellowship, 18 children, 18 children have been adopted and are now being brought up in the way of the Lord. From the preaching of the word of God. Isn't that an amazing thing? What if there would be one more? Two more? Maybe more? Who knows? If, you, if not you, who? If not now, then? Listen, I know this is a, a challenge to us. Pray. Go to the Lord. God, is this something you want me to pursue? And, and again, not everybody has children. Not everybody feels led or called to parent. I understand that. Pursue God, what his word would say, what the Lord would say to you. By the way, we're refurbishing that house right next door there. And we're going to put orphans in it, ex-foster kids. And they're going to be here. And I'm going to, I'm going to say to you all, we're going to say to you all, here they are. Would you love on them? How can you get involved? Maybe up to and including actually taking that step yourself. Who knows? Who would have thought let us pray. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you so much for your word that penetrates to our heart like a two-edged sword dividing soul from spirit and bone from marrow. God, I'm praying that your word is weighing heavy upon our hearts. I'm praying even right now, Holy Spirit, that you are moving your people to act, to move. That we would not be content to, to dwell in security and comfort when we know that there are people out there perishing, specifically kids. God, I pray that you would forgive us collectively, your church for our blind spot that we have towards those who are most vulnerable, those who are languishing in affliction. While we relish the comfort and security that we have, the material wealth. God, I pray that you would forgive us for our blindness. I pray that you would forgive us for our neglect. And that you would call us to act. God, I pray that the church in this nation would rise up and eliminate the issue of the orphan. And all praise and glory and honor would be unto you. I pray for those young men and young women, those kids out there that right now 
don't have a father, don't have a mother to teach them about the Lord, to love them. I pray that you would provide for them, that you would save them, that you would rescue them, that you would put it upon somebody's heart to be their rescuer, just as we have been rescued. God, I pray for this body. You said greater works than these will we accomplish. God, I pray for the greater works. That even right now there's somebody feeling led, the full conviction of your weight of authority to move in your authority and your presence and take a wonderful step toward adoption. I pray for the Clarksville Covenant House. I pray for the those who will reside there, the young women with Darian. God, I pray that this church will envelop them in love in the gospel. I pray for the salvation of souls. I'm already praising you, God, for the work that you're going to do through the Clarksville Covenant House. And I pray that this church would be faithful to that call. God, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And most of all, if there's somebody here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior,